Listen, aren't you glad that as you've walked through the doors today, the same God that we read about in the Bible that touched the blind, healed the leopard, healed the lame, rose people who were dead back to life, is the same God that's working in this room today, the same God that's working in your life today. Listen, we don't sing songs about an ancient God. We don't sing songs about a God that we hope can do these things. We don't do, sing songs so that we can appease a God so that he looks kindly on our behalf. We sing songs to a God who is worthy of praise, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. And in this room today, listen, maybe there's some of you today that need a touch from God. Maybe there's some of you today that need God to work in your life. Maybe today, as you look towards Christmas, you've got a family that is broken. Maybe today you're struggling with sickness. Maybe today you're worried about a job. Maybe today you're worried about your marriage. Maybe today you're worried about your kids. I don't know what it is, but I know this. When we go to God and when we take our requests to God, God hears us and God responds. And so God, today, as we've come through these doors, God, God, we've come with different needs, with different desires. And God, we bring them to your feet. We lay them at your feet and we ask you to do what only you can do. God, move on our behalf. Work in our hearts. Work in our lives. God, change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God a shout of praise. High five, five people. Tell them you're glad to see them. Well, hey, I don't know um, if you know this, but please grab these. Take these, pass these out every chance that you get. Um, and so when you come across people, invite them to church. Here's the reason that we push this so hard. Um, Christmas is one of those opportunities. There's different seasons. And in those seasons, there's opportunities for us as a church to really see people who maybe don't normally go to church come through the doors of church. And what it takes is an invite. And so please, please, please grab these cards. Take them everywhere you can. We've got stacks of cards. And uh, we would love for you to grab as many as you can, take them, pass them out, invite everybody that you know. Here's the thing. Um, as you look on the back of these, you see what is available during December. One of the things that's interesting to me, I've been on a lot of calls with different pastors over the past couple of weeks. There's a lot of churches not doing um, service on Christmas morning. We are. And uh, we're going to do a service at 11 o'clock Christmas morning. And I want to encourage you, be here, bring everybody that you know. Listen, invite a lot of people. Um, because listen, presents are great. Santa is great. We love getting together with family, opening presents and everything like that. But we have to remember, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we are celebrating the birth of the one who came to this earth and saved us. And so there's no better, I, I've, I've thought about doing it every year, even when church is not on Christmas. I've thought, and we might do it, um, but having service every Christmas morning, because listen, that's the real reason, and we don't want to lose focus of that. And so we're coming together, and we're going to get together, and so be sure to be here for that. Um, the candlelight service is really cool, too, uh, on Christmas Eve, so make sure, listen, invite people, just invite them. And uh, when we don't have room, if you normally attend and you normally come, listen, just stand on the side uh, so that those who normally don't come, they can have a seat. Um, but listen, I, I'm glad that you're here. I think God's doing something really special. I think God's really stirring in our hearts. I've been having a lot of conversations with people and, um, and, and they see the need right now. There, there is a need for the church to be the church. Um, there is a need for the church to really step up and say, um, listen, I, I want to chase God with everything that I have. And so um, I'm excited to see what God does. Um, I'm excited to begin to share the vision with you um, of what next year looks like. 
Because listen, we are, we are going full force guns ablazing next year. And, uh, and so I, I'm excited for what we're going to do. And listen, I think what we saw on the streets yesterday at the Christmas parade, if you came, it is a little glimpse of what God wants to do in our church. Listen, I love the fact that we got a new building, but you know what I love more? Running out of space. Amen. I don't, this isn't big enough. God wants to do more in this community. God wants to reach more people. And, uh, and so we've got to continue to do everything we can as a church to reach as many people as possible. Because listen, we're not reaching them to fill, the, fill a building. We're reaching them so that we can tell them about Jesus and their souls can be saved from an eternity separated from God. Amen. It's life and death. And that's why we do this. So there was a guy and... Um, And every year he would put out Christmas decorations and he would put those plastic reindeer. He would put the plastic Santas out by the road of his house. And he kind of lived on a country road and he would light them up and they looked so good. But every year somebody would drive by and somebody would run over those decorations and just destroy them. And he was getting so frustrated and he was getting so mad. He didn't know what to do. So finally he went and he bought a snowman. And he cut the head of the snowman off. And he went and he bought quickcrete. <laughs> and he dumped quickcrete into the snowman. And he filled it all the way to the top. And he put the head of the snowman right back on. And he went into the house. And a few days later, sure enough, he hears the loudest thud that he has ever heard. And he walks out and there is a car right there that was trying to just plow through that snowman. It hit that quick creek. It destroyed the car. The guy couldn't get away. He's standing there looking at him. And the guy with the quick creek just started laughing. He was like, hey, quit hitting my stuff. The guy learned his lesson that year. He never had a problem for the rest of his life with getting his stuff ran over. But here's the thing. Revenge feels good. And I think, you know, a lot of times in our life, when something wrong is done to us, revenge really feels, when when somebody does something wrong to you, watching them struggle, watching them suffer, there's something inside of us that's just um, bad that makes it feel really good. And we're like, I love this. And if that's you, Listen, I want you to understand this message is for you today because that's the wrong response and that's not the response God wants us to have. So if you were sitting here and you were laughing and you were like, yes, this is for you because you are a bad person. If you have your Bibles, we're looking at Joseph today. If you have your Bibles, open up. We're going to start somewhere else and you're going to go, how in the world do these two connect? We're going to start in John chapter eight. If you have your Bibles. I want to read a story to you. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, and they said, Jesus, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? And they were using this question in order to trap Jesus, in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger, and they kept on questioning him. He straightened up and he said to them, let the one who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote in the ground. At this, those who heard, began to go away one at a time, older and then the younger, until all who was left was Jesus. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and sin no more. Now flip over to Matthew chapter one, starting in verse 18. It says this, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. His mother Mary pledged to be married to Joseph, 
But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because jo Joseph, her uh, husband, was a faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her publicly, uh, expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered these things, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. The first thing I want us to look at today is this. Joseph responds right even when he thought he was wronged. I want you to think about this. Think about this story. Joseph and Mary are two young people who fall in love. Joseph thinks Mary is just the greatest thing that has ever come on the face of the earth. He wants to marry her. He begins to date her. He begins to get down on one knee. You can imagine the moment he gets down on one knee, ask Mary, Mary, marry me. Mary, marry me. And she was confused, <laughs> like we are, but Mary, marry me. And Mary says yes, and they are so excited, and they begin to plan the wedding. And it's going to be a nice little simple wedding. And it's going to be something so beautiful. But these two, that the Bible describes as these two people who are righteous, these two people, two people who have found favor with God, that's the kind of character. Joseph has seen this character in Mary. Joseph has seen the kind of woman that Mary is. And he loves her for that. Now imagine one day, they are engaged to be married. And Mary walks up to Joseph. Babe, you'll never believe this. I'm pregnant. And Joseph is like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? Like, I'm not the dad. Like this, I don't know why you're smiling. This is not good news. Like, like I, we're engaged. What have you done? Like, I can't believe you've done this. And can you imagine the heartbreak of Joseph in this moment getting the news that the woman that he loves, the woman that he wanted to marry, the woman that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with, the woman that he has committed himself to, the woman that he saw with this incredible integrity and character now comes to him and says, babe, I'm pregnant. And then it gets even better because she goes, guess who the father is? God. And he's like, what kind of kook did I marry? I am so glad that this is coming out now and not after we got married. Like what in the world has, what do you mean God is the father? Like never before in the history of the world has anybody made this claim. And now all of a sudden Mary is saying, hey, Joseph, look, and now, can you imagine, can you imagine this scenario? Can you imagine hearing this news and then thinking she has lost her mind? She ate some funny mushroom somewhere and just went crazy. I've told her to stop doing that and she found some somewhere and she has lost her mind. Can you just imagine this moment? Because Joseph is standing there and he's thinking, she was perfect. She's had incredible character. She has an incredible family. She was raised the right way. And now all of a sudden she's claiming that she's pregnant. See, what you have to understand is how serious this truly is. See, according to the law, what we read in that first passage, according to the law, the right of Joseph is to drag her out into the middle of the street to make a public declaration of what she has done. And to let everybody know that she has done this, that she has committed adultery. And then it is his right then to then stone her. This is how, Siri is, this is how serious what Mary was saying really is. But Joseph, 
See, this, this is the incredible thing. Joseph was hurt. See, nobody really spends a lot of time thinking about that. As we read the story, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about how Joseph processes this information, how Joseph really gets past this. Because think about it, when the one that you love hurts you so deeply, the one that you love hurts you so deeply, how do you respond? See, Joseph thought that he was wrong. Look at what John 8 3 through 5 says, Teacher, the law and the Pharisees, the, the, the law, uh, teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, made her stand before the group, and said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Mary has just walked before, uh, before Joseph and said, I, You are not the father. And in the law, commands us to stone this woman. See, here's the thing. The goal is not when you get hurt deeply to then hurt the other person as deeply as you can. Look at how Joseph responds. So many times when we get hurt, what we want to do is we want to hurt the other person deeply. When we get hurt, our natural response is to say, I want to hurt you deeper. Think about how many times you get in an argument with your spouse. Think about how many times something is said that hurts you. And then think about how many times you know something is going to cut so much deeper. And so you end up saying that. And then all of a sudden you start going down a hole of pain that you never saw coming. Because the goal for you is to hurt them worse than they've hurt you. And you begin to throw up this guard. You begin to throw up this, uh, this facade of, I'm not going to let you hurt me more than I hurt you. I'm not going to be in more pain than you. And so I want to hurt you as deeply as I can. But look at how Joseph responded. The interesting thing is, it says this, but Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. So he knew what he was supposed to do. But it says this, but yet he did not want to expose her publicly and disgrace her. He knew what he could do. He knew what was at his disposal. He knew what the law provided for him to do. But then Joseph chose this. Even though you've wronged me, I'm going to choose a different path. Even though you've hurt me, I'm going to choose a different path. Listen, maybe this year what needs to happen, maybe there's some people coming to your Christmas and they've hurt you. Maybe there's some people that when they walk through the doors, it's just one of those things. They've said some mean things. They've done some mean things. And all of a sudden, as they walk through the doors, what you want to do is you want to lash out. Maybe you've got that family member or that friend that comes over for Christmas and every time, they are a negative, mean person every single time. Could have done better on the decorations. <laughs> Meal's decent. I mean, it's not great. I've had a lot better before. And you've been you know, in the kitchen working so hard in order to create a good meal. Heather got strawberries yesterday. What were they, $15 for strawberries? Listen, you better put a smile on your face if you were eating somewhere this year because it's expensive. I don't care if it's good or not. But maybe they walk through the door and every time they walk through the door, I mean, it just sucks the life out of the room. And then what you do is your natural response is, well, if you're going to go low, I'm going to go lower. I'm going to hurt you deeper. Well, your outfit looks terrible. Would have been nice if you fixed your hair. Hey, looks like you put on a couple pounds this year. That always hurts. Listen, that, I mean, can't go wrong there. You can, don't do that. But listen, here's the thing. Joseph decided I'm going to respond differently. I'm not going to publicly disgrace her, but so many times what we want to do is we want to respond. Our goal is if I've been hurt, I want to hurt you deeper. But look at the example that Joseph is setting. Joseph is saying, you've hurt me, Mary. Because at this point, Joseph still doesn't know that this actually is of God and Mary is telling the truth. That this is the son of God coming to the earth, the Messiah that they have been looking for for so long. 
For over 800 years, this baby that Joseph is fixing to be the father of, this baby is the one that has been prophesied about for 800 years. Joseph doesn't know this yet. But in spite of that, Joseph still chooses to say, even though you've hurt me, I'm not going to hurt you. What if you choose to respond differently? Romans 12 says this, Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, it says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. <laughs> your enemy's fixing to walk through the door at Christmas. Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here's your response. When you respond kind to somebody who is deliberately being mean to you, who is hurting you, Paul says this, it's like dumping coals on them. Hot coals. It hurts. Listen, it hurts far more when somebody who is going through something and begins to talk negatively about you and hurt you, it it, it hurts far more when you are kind and they can't get to you than when you start having a battle of who can go lower. And so many times that's what we do. So many times we we try to see how low we can truly go. See, listen, Joseph did the right thing even when the right thing wasn't done to him. Because at this point, Joseph still didn't know. Even though he had been hurt, he didn't want to hurt her. Even though you've been hurt, listen, don't go low. Here's what I tell my kids all the time. You cannot control the way somebody else acts. You can't. You can't control what somebody says. You can't control what somebody does. You can't control what somebody does to you. The only thing that you can control is your response. See, what you're held accountable for, what you're responsible for, is your response. Joseph proved right here that we have the ability to respond right even when we're hurt so deep. Because in this moment, Joseph was choosing, I'm not going to marry her, but I'm also not going to shame her. He chose the right thing. Maybe this Christmas, what needs to happen is you need to begin to choose. I'm not going low, but I'm going to choose to pour some coals on them by going high. Feels good pouring coals on people. No, I'm joking. But do the right thing. Because listen, it's going to bother them. It's going to hurt them that they can't get you down to their level if you will go high. Second thing I want us to see here is this. Joseph recognized that he was wrong. Once you turn to the person next to you here, we're going to do a, um, a, a, an all skate here. Everything's, everybody's going to participate. For guys, it's going to be a lot harder in this moment. Um, some of you are already starting to sweat because I think you know what is coming. Um, for some of you, your throat is going to get really, really dry and you're not going to understand and know how to do this. But if you will look at the person next to you, I want you to say this. Okay, listen. <laughs> I don't know if I can tell you. Heather, you're going to have to come read this. I can't get it out. <laughs> when you say this, I was wrong and I'm sorry. <laughs> harder than you think. I was wrong and I'm sorry. For some of you, you didn't know that those went together. For some of you, it's the first time you've heard those words uttered and your ears are like, I don't understand what that means. (laughs) You're having to get your dictionary out and you're like, Hey Siri, what does I am wrong and I am sorry mean coming from my husband? Um, And so you're trying to figure this out. It's okay, settle in. We're going to figure it out together because it's hard. Um, How many times have 
uh, you, you know, you, you've been driving down the road and instead of using a map, you decide I know where to go. And, uh, and, and then there's somebody sitting in the seat next to you. And she was like, I told you so. And they never hear I was wrong and I'm sorry. Because listen, what we decided to do that they didn't know was there was a more scenic route that we wanted to take and we were loving the time that we were spending together. And so we just wanted to extend that time that we had together and we tried to make it a date, but they ruined it because they were like, oh, you don't know where you're going. And I'm like, man, this is, this is a loving, mo like trying to be romantic. But I was wrong and I'm sorry. Listen, why is it so hard to say those words to the people that we love the most? You ever notice that? It's easy. Listen, if you're walking down the streets and you bump shoulders with somebody, oh man, I'm so sorry. So sorry, excuse me. But you walk through the house and you bump shoulders with your wife, you're like, get out of the way! <laughs> Knock you down next time. Well, why is it that it's so hard to apologize and say, I'm sorry, to the ones you love the most? So many times, what ends up happening? We don't apologize. We go to bed mad. We know, I just need to say I'm sorry and this whole thing's over. But there is not a chance I'm saying I'm sorry. <laughs> Look at what Joseph does. Right here, it says this in verse 20. It says, but after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, do not be afraid. So look, here's what's happened. Mary came and told Joseph, babe, I'm pregnant. I'm so excited. And he's like, what? Heartbroken. And then he sa she says, and the child is from God. And then he's heartbroken and now thinks she's lost her mind. So they go their separate ways. He goes home. He cries. It's a hard night. He falls asleep. He doesn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden says this, a dream in a dream, an angel came and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to his son and you will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Amen. Can you imagine the peace that comes over Joseph knowing that the information that he was given by Mary and the confusion that was brought on him now in a dream he understands and he knows as this angel appears to him before in a dream he understands and he knows and what she said is true. This is special. I, I was wrong. And I'm sorry. See, it doesn't talk about the interaction that Mary and Joseph had when he got this information. But can you imagine him? He loved her so much. Cared about her so much. And now to find out what she has actually said is true. That God has chosen them as a special couple on the face of the earth to carry the Messiah and to be the father of the Messiah, the savior of the world. Now look at John 8. In verse 5, it says, this, in, uh, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this to trap Jesus in order to accuse him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. And when they kept questioning him, so Jesus kind of ignores the question. A lady is brought to them. They found her um, having an affair. They bring her out. And here's the thing. It was almost like a setup. They throw her at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus begins to bend down and he begins to write something in the ground. And then they continue to question him. Jesus, aren't you going to respond? Aren't you going to say anything? Don't you understand what the law of Moses says? Don't you understand the right that we have right here in this moment? Why don't you say something? And then Jesus responds. Let anyone who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. 
Again, he stooped down and he began to write in the ground at this. Those who heard began to walk away, the older first, until only Jesus was left with a woman still standing there. See, here's the thing that we like to do so many times. When we find ourselves wrong, what we want to do is we want to point our finger at somebody else. When we find ourselves in the situation of, I was wrong, what we like to do so many times is we like to go, well, do you know what they did? Do you know what they said? See, how many times when your marriage is struggling, even though maybe you don't say your marriage is struggling publicly, how many times do you begin to criticize other marriages? I can tell you every single time a marriage is struggling because what you do is you begin to criticize what you yourself are struggling with. Every time. Have you seen their marriage? Have you seen what they're doing? Have you seen what they're going through? And I, can, I could look at them and say, don't worry about them. Your marriage is the one that's the problem. Why? Because what you like to is you want to take the light off of the situation and the struggle that's going on in your life and you want to shine it on somebody else so that that bright light is not on you. Have you seen the way that they're spending their money? Have you seen the way that they're just throwing their money all over the place and just spending it so crazy? You know why people say that? Because they're not handling their money properly. Because they find themselves in massive debt. Have you seen their kids and how terrible their kids are acting? Every time we go to a restaurant, every time they go out in public, they are just terrible kids. You know why they say that? Because their own kids are struggling and they don't know how to handle them. Why? Because we like to take the light off of us and we like to shine it brighter on somebody else because we don't like people looking and seeing our mistakes. We don't like people seeing where we were wrong. And so what we want to do is we want to point the finger and we want to say, <laughs> no, 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 you're wrong. You're doing a lot worse than me. You're a lot worse person than I am. And we love to point the finger at everybody else. See, here's what I want you to understand. Jesus was not saying that you may not struggle because so many times what we do is we love to look and we love to say, well, Mary went and got pregnant. <sighs> at, least, at least my wife didn't do that. But look at what Jesus says right here is the people begin to walk and say, Jesus, look at this woman caught in adultery. Jesus bends down and then he stands up and I think he looks every one of them in the eye. And a lot of people debate, what did he write in the sand? I bet he started writing their names and then their sin next to it. I don't think that's what Jesus is because that does not fit the character of Jesus. Because even though the Pharisees were such sinful, terrible people, Jesus still publicly never shamed people. And I don't, I don't know what he wrote in the sand, but as he stood up, I think he looked everyone in the eye and I think as he spoke these words, I think there was something that cut to the heart that they knew as he said, okay, I understand what it says. But you act like you're walking in front of me. You act like you've come in front of me and you are the perfect person. You act like you've come before me and you don't have any struggles. You act like as you come before me, your marriage isn't struggling. You, you act like you weren't just fighting in the car before you got out of the car to walk through the doors of the church and you're screaming at each other, I get, get you, and then you get out of the car and you're like, God bless you. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. It's a God of miracles. God, we need you to perform a miracle tonight because I think I'm going to kill my husband. I don't want to go to jail. But how many times do we look and do we say their sin is worse than mine and what they're doing is worse than what I'm doing and we begin to justify what we're doing. And here's what I want you to understand. As the angel of the Lord appeared before Joseph in a dream, what Joseph had to understand in that moment was one thing. I am wrong. I'm wrong. 
I, I thought Mary had done this, but Mary was actually telling the truth. See, maybe what you have to understand is I'm not looking at what everybody else is doing wrong, but my responsibility is to fix my heart. My responsibility is to fix my relationship with the Lord, not anybody else's. See, I've got to deal with me. And that's what Joseph had to do in that moment. And so uh, thought number three is this. Joseph lift, listened to God and was obedient. Matthew 1, 24 says this. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. Here's, your, here's the thing. It's not your job to understand everything. It's your job to be obedient. It's not your job to understand everything. Still in this moment, I don't think Joseph understood how this happened and fully what was going on. Because listen, Joseph had gotten the information about the birds and the bees. He understood how things happen. But he had never gotten the information about the bees and God. He's like, I don't know how this works. I, I don't know how this happened. All I know is that the Spirit of God came in and touched Mary's womb. And now the Son of God, the Savior of the world, is going to be born. So many times what we do is we wait to fully understand before we want to be obedient to what God says. And maybe what God is telling you is this. You won't understand everything. All I need from you is yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I don't understand. I don't understand how this can be. Joseph got up in the morning. I don't understand still. I, I'm still not, but all I know is this. I went to bed and I was broken and I was sad and I was distraught. And then all of a sudden an angel of the Lord appears to me in the dream. And in the dream he says, no, this is of God. And you and Mary are a special couple that are going to be the father and the mother of the savior of the world. Now take her as your wife. Joseph said, yes, Lord. How many times is our response not, yes, Lord? How many times do we wait to say, but God, I don't understand. But God, I, I need some more. But God, I, I, I need some more information. God, you need to tell me. I, you, I, I know you're pressing on my heart. I'm walking through the store and there's somebody and I feel like you want me to share the gospel with them. But God, I've never met them before. God, I don't know what they're going through. And God, I don't know how to do this. God, what if they ask me a question that I don't understand? God, you want me to invite somebody to church. But God, what, what if they come through the door? and they don't like it? What if they come through the door and nothing happens? What if they come through the door and they get mad? What if they walk through the door and they never come back again? God, you've got to give me some more information. God, you want me to start a new business, but I don't know how that's going to happen. God, you want me to start serving in church? God, you want me to give at the end of the year, but I don't understand how I'm going to be able to give because I'm looking at the economy and things aren't matching up. God, I don't understand. And God's saying, I just want you to say, yes, Lord. Yes, God, you said it, so I'm going to do it. I don't understand everything. I can't put it all together, but yes, Lord. What if that becomes our response? Because here's the thing that's interesting. It says this, the next morning, Joseph got up and did what he was supposed to do. Joseph got up and did what he was supposed to do. See, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Joseph got up and immediately obeyed and did what he was supposed to do. He got up, he got dressed, and he went to Mary's house, and he looked at her, and he said, an angel appeared to me, and I am sorry. Please forgive me. See, listen, whatever God's calling you to do, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Don't wait. Be obedient to what God is calling you to do. John 8, 9 through 11. And at this... Those who began to hear go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. Jesus straightened up and said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, neither do I condemn you. Go now and sin no more. It's interesting that the first people to walk away 
says are the older people. Because what you have to understand is that wisdom comes with age. And how many times do we, when we are young, hold grudges longer, hold on to hurt and pain longer, don't say I'm sorry as quick. But the older you get, it's a lot easier to say I'm sorry because we begin to realize it's not that big of a deal. And I've been holding on to things for way too long. The older ones began to walk away first, but then look at what Jesus did. Jesus looks at the woman and Jesus says this. He says, hey, where, where are they? She says, they've left. I know. And here's what I want you to understand. They don't condemn you because they have their own pain and struggle. They have their own sin that they're dealing with. But I want you to understand. I'm perfect. And I don't condemn you. But don't go keep doing the same thing that you were doing. Maybe today what you need to understand is this. You've walked through the door and there is some sin you're struggling with and what God is impressing on your heart is this. Hey, you're forgiven. But don't walk out and keep doing the same thing. Don't walk out and keep living the same way. Don't walk out and keep doing the same thing over and over and over. See, when God impresses on our heart, look at what Joseph did. God spoke and Joseph was immediately obedient. God's desire for you today is to immediately be obedient to what, is he, to what he is impressing on your heart, the conviction that he is bringing to you today. What is it in your life that God wants to do? Will you pray with me? Listen, your response is important. Your response does matter. God does want to do some incredible things in your life. But God wants to work in you so that he can then work through you. Maybe today what you've done is you've come through the doors and what you've done is you've been hurt, but maybe you need to change the response that you naturally give. Instead of trying to go e even lower, instead of trying to hurt them even more, maybe what you need to do is you need to go high. Maybe it's not I'm going to hurt them as bad as they've hurt me. Maybe it's not as I, I'm going to get as, as deep as I can. Maybe today what you need to recognize is you are not perfect. And just because you've been wronged doesn't mean you're not dealing with your own issue also. And maybe you just need to say these words. I'm wrong and I'm sorry. Or maybe what you need to do is you just need to be obedient. God, if you said it, I'm going to obey. Because as you walk through the doors, Jesus is saying this, listen, I forgive you, but go and sin no more. Don't keep living the same way. Don't keep choosing the same path. Don't keep coming and confessing the same thing over and over, but yet doing nothing different about it. Maybe today what you need to do is you need to be obedient, immediately obedient. God, we love you. God, we thank you for what you're doing. God, I pray in this Christmas season, you will work in our hearts. Change us from the inside out as we look at the characters of Christmas. God, we look at Joseph. God, the weight of the information that was given him, but yet his incredible, godly, righteous response. God, may we respond like Joseph this Christmas season. God, I pray for those right now that are dealing with, with salvation. God, I pray that you will save them. God, I pray that they will confess their sins. They will turn to you. They will give their heart to you. God, I pray those that are watching online right now, God, save them. Change their hearts. God, stir in us. Don't let us be the same people we walked in as. Help us be more like you. In Jesus' name.